We use that to uh, start our uh, Rosh Hashanah evening services now, ever since I've been at uh, Ramat Zion, and I love how it starts uh, people hopefully uh, get willing in the right mindset. So a couple of uh, caveats before we're going to jump into the text today. I'm not a scholar of Rav Kook. I'm not a scholar of Kabbalah. If you look at me, despite my hairline, I'm not even old enough to be studying Kabbalah yet. Um, this is not, I'm not going to teach you. We're going to study uh, some texts together that I found uh, very compelling and obviously in the mode of um, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Just a couple of, uh, here's your you know, Wikipedia biography of Rav Cook, if you don't know who he is. So he was born in 1865 in Lithuania, definitely a product of the yeshiva world. He went to the Belazhin yeshiva, um, but he also had a, a penchant for the more mystical men. Um, he was recognized as an ilui, as a Talmud uh, you know, a scholar, and he very much was a scholar and a halachist, and he spent part of his career doing that kind of stuff. Um, in 1904, he moved to Israel, and he moved to Jaffa, which was the Tel Aviv, right, of its day, and very much in the same thing in the mode. Um, and he was the chief rabbi there. He was the rabbi for all the secular chalutzim who didn't recognize him, right, as their chief rabbi. Uh, he was in uh, England for a little bit of World War I, and then in 1919 he came back and he was appointed the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, and then two years, two years later the chief rabbi of the entire area known as Palestine at the time. Um, he was what we would today call a religious Zionist. He was amazed by this idea that there were all these secular Jews, Jews who had given up kind of on God and religion, but who were doing what religious Jews had talked about for so long, which was reclaiming the land. And he, because he spent those first um, maybe 13 or 14 years working with them, he really saw something miraculous in that. And he really um, saw God's hand in what they were doing. He tried to bridge this divide. The, the older religious Yeshua really looked negatively on the, on the newer secular Zionists. And he said to them, no, don't disparage them. God's working through them. And, and he really wanted to bridge a divide. He definitely wanted to you know, bring them back and, and have them think religiously. But he didn't think that they were bad. And that was part of his whole, um, part of his whole philosophy was that um, he really saw God and good in everything. You have to figure it out. He even uh, once argued in some uh, essay, atheism is good. Because he says atheism challenges all the bad things about religion, where religion has become stale or corrupt or all these things. He said even those kinds of things where we may say atheism can be nothing good for religion. He actually said um, there was good in that. So... He was really kind of a, a radical thinker um, in that way. And uh, he wrote um, letters and essays. He didn't really write books, though, even though they got printed as books. Those were later um, collections by his students that they tried to edit them together. Um, so we're going to look at one book called Orota Chuva, The Lights of Repentance. And this is the English translation. And all I did was read it and think about it and teach it to my congregants. And I really recommend it. It has other things in here uh, as well. Um, and we're just going to look at a bunch of selections that I jumped off the page at me. We're not going to have time to look at them all. Um, but hopefully all of these can be good for teaching sermon sparks or just for your own uh, process of tshuva. Since I don't want you looking at the packets yet, I have to learn from uh, my teacher, Rabbi Tucker, who was my teacher at JTS. Um, I want to read you just uh, to get a little taste of who he was. This is a, a poem or part of a poem that, uh, that he wrote. If you didn't know, he was also a poet. Expanses divine my soul craves. Confine me not in cages of substance or of spirit. I am lovesick. I thirst. I thirst for God as a deer for water brooks. Alas, who can describe my pain? Who will be a violin to express the songs of my grief? I am bound to the world. All creatures, all people are my friends. Many parts of my soul are intertwined with them. But how can I share with them my light? I hope that gives you a little taste of kind of the, the mystic that he was who wanted to see connection between everyone and everything in this world and had this uh, tremendous yearning for God as well. What we're going to do, we'll look through a few of these passages. The way it's broken out is into kind of three sections. It's, it's retitled three different times because I taught it over three different sessions. 
um, to my congregation. Um, and because he wrote these kinds of thoughts more like diary entries and, and journals as opposed to one book straight through that his student later edited together, I feel like it's totally kosher to kind of be looking at these little snippets and passages out of context because apparently that's kind of the way that he wrote. When the spirit moved him, he, he wrote a section. He didn't sit down apparently to, uh, to write this book straight through. And again, we're not gonna, definitely not have time to go through all the pages, um, but I'll pick out a few passages. We'll see how far we get. And then, uh, of course, please read the whole book, but read through all of these, study them on your own. I'm gonna look at the first one on the first page. No. Sorry, I didn't make the copies. <laughs> somebody got to share with somebody so some people in the back can share with themselves. <clears throat> Thank you. Ehud, if, they, if you email Ehud, you can get Absolutely. additional copies Absolutely. so you're sharing with somebody to make sure that you have it uh, by the end. Rabbi Sela at TRZ, R A B B I S E L A at TRZ, Temple Ramatzion. Dot org and I'll email you more copies. The first paragraph. The whole world is pervaded by harmony. The unifying congruence penetrates all branches of existence. Right? He is a classical Kabbalist that everything in the world is God just reordered. Right? That's Jewish mysticism, the, much, the, the amount that I've studied. <laughs> is that God, there was only God, God contracted God's self, and God recreated sort of or reformed God's self, and that's what the world is made of. It's, if we don't understand that the world is all connected because it's all part of God, we're missing a fundamental understanding of the nature of existence. So there's that harmony. Everything is connected because everything is ultimately God. The inner moral sense and its mighty claims represent an echo of the unitary voice of all parts of existence all of which interpenetrate and the self is permeated with them and united with all. You have to, when you hear that push for goodness, righteousness, you're starting to see the inner workings, the inner connections of everything in the universe. But then already he, he jumps right to your first thing. You say, okay, everything is connected, everything is God, then everything should be good. Why is there evil. Why is it? How could bad things be if everything is God? And he's ready for your question right away. Every moral severance in thought or deed, in character or disposition creates many wounds that inflict many inner pains in all aspects of the soul. The basis of these spiritual pains is the disturbing force of withdrawing the light of life emanating from the general order of existence from the life channels of the sinning soul. So as far as this much that I understand of Lurianic Kabbalah is that when God reflowed God's self, or let's say God's energy into creating the world, that was kind of the first flow of divine energy. But there is a continuous flow of divine energy called the Shefa, which continually makes the world alive. If the Shefa were to ever stop, we would cease to exist, or the world would cease to exist. Evil is the break in that flow or the diminution of that flow. I think of it kind of like, uh, if I try to imagine it as like divine plumbing, right? If you ever had sprinklers, you know, all of a sudden one doesn't pop up, right? Because there's a leak, right, somewhere in there. Now sometimes you get little leaks and sometimes you get major breaks. So far so good? Okay. Um, so when we find evil or we find negativity in the world, right? We feel pain, and it's all about some kind of disconnecting of that constant flow of life-giving divine energy that keeps the world in existence. And it's and so pain, therefore, is actually kind of a, a good thing in the sense that it makes us recognize that the flow has been interrupted. The purer a soul is, the more it will experience the disturbance of its pains until it will still the pain in the life stream of penitence, which flows from the divine source, which mends all the torn parts, and sends forth a life restoring dew flowing directly from all realms of existence. There will be a reunion. The life restoring flow will reach the soul that has been restored to its higher life in great mercy and abiding joy. 
What is tshuva? And it's not rhetorical. What is tshuva? When a person, a congregant comes up to you and says, Rabbi, you talk about tshuva. What's tshuva? What would you say to them? In this sense, it's the restoration of the balance. The restoration of the constant flow. Is that what you would say to your congregant? Before you read I should have asked you that. I pedagogically, I apologize. I should have asked you that before we read this paragraph, because now your mind is totally infiltrated with his to thoughts. my congregant, which would be a sick person, I might say that. Okay. What would you say? What's tshuva? Returning to the right path. Okay, returning to the right path. Right, you've done wrong, you've gone to the left, and you've got to go to the right. Or you go to the right and the left. Okay. What? Change. Tshuva is change. Okay. It's reordering or re Very nice. And take that and put it, can someone put that in Ralph Cook's words? I like that we put it, re-enlivening the connection, right? right? Tshuva, for him, right, is normally when you think about Tshuva, it's more the classical definition, right? You, doing, you went this way, you have to go that way. You did wrong, you have to fix it with right. And here he's saying, no, it's actually about there's always connection between everything, but sometimes the connection is not working so good. Something's happened to that connection. It's realignment. Right, it's realignment, it's reflow. Right? I love to think of the divine plumbing, right? <laughs> There's a break in the tube, and you've got to fix the tube. You have to make sure that you're connecting in the intended correct way, which theoretically should be without barriers. Yeah? Is he, is he suggesting, then, that Tshuva is, is another kind of shepherd, is what I'm from this. It is always flowing. Yeah. I'm not sure he'd say it's a different kind of shefa, but he's saying shiva is this whole process of I should be feeling the shefa, and I'm not, and therefore, okay, that's the first recognition is something is wrong, and now I have to get it right. I know that there is a life stream. I know that there should be a good connection. How, what do I have to do to get back into it or to fix it? Something happened that is stopping this constant divine flow that I can be in touch with, and I know what's there. Does that make sense? Um, let's look at the second paragraph. What happens? What are these moral severances? What happens that's bad? One example he gives. The stubborn determination to remain with the same opinion and to invoke it in support of a sinful disposition to which one has become habituated, whether in action or in opinion, is a sickness resulting from a grievous enslavement that does not permit the light of penitence to shine in full strength. Penitence is the aspiration for the true original freedom, which is the divine freedom, wherein there is no enslavement of any kind. Now, what does this remind you of? What does this sound like to you? Well, Say more. But it's stubborn, it's a stubborn determination to be ruled by our needs, our wants, our view of life relationship. In a sense, but the freedom maybe is to arise to our higher self, we could say, but our, we're living, we're, we're pulled down, the gravity is pulling us down lower self. Mm. Mm. Very nice. Anyone ever experienced that? With a congregant, a family member, do it yourself a lot? Come on, I went to rabbinical school. I know what's right for the Jewish people. <laughs> I know what's right for my congregation. I know better than everybody. What else? Any other thoughts on that? When he talked about enslavement, it reminded me of the Haggadah and, uh, and the two kinds of slavery, right? The slavery of the body and the slavery of the mind. And how often we don't talk about the slave of the body so much anymore because we don't see those slaves, but we easily become, I think, enslaved to certain ideas. I like the word aspiration. 
Well, I'll get back in one second. Go ahead. And I think that there is um, an interesting thing about this is that you um, or one can believe something strongly for a long time and then become aware, almost on the periphery, like maybe read an article or hear someone speak, of some kind of um, kink or some kind of opening, like, whoa, you know? And there is a process where you have to decide, are you going to let that in and mm. then really rethink what your assumptions are, your beliefs are? Mm. Mm. It takes a lot of courage, mm. I think, to do that. Mm -hmm. well, that makes me think of idolatry, mm -hmm. right? When we've held up something without any ability to criticize, rethink, reevaluate. So what was your name? Uh, so aspiration was an interesting choice, assuming yeah. it's an accurate translation. Well, uh, because it does suggest that they're striving unfinished work. Mm. Right. Shuva is a God, but not God. Right. Shuva is a process, not a destination, right? He gets to that in a, in a little bit. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll look at it uh, in the next paragraph. And should we, can we go on to you had something to say? I yeah. Don't think I said is the word opening and all of that. It's, this is sort of dependent upon the willingness to be open. Mm. To, uh, and if one adheres to a specific point of view, political, religious, whatever it is, and is unwilling to hear other, then there no longer is openness and there will be that blockage and you'll never be able to move through. Right. And I love that metaphor, right? The blockage is the absolute wrong thing we don't ever want, right? We constantly want flow. We constantly want connection. And if you hold on to certain things so much that you're putting up walls, mm -hmm. you're going to, I hate to say it, you're going to like die inside. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's the point brought up in the previous paragraph where the desire to return is made stronger by how pure a soul you are, mm. such that you know, if, if you're corrupted in some way, then the desire to return is lessened. Mm. That uh, it's even harder for you to overcome that and even hear uh, and be open to that listening. Beautiful. Yes. You know, I, I think it just, in my mind, the question that, that rolls around in my head is dovetailing with what you talked about, mm -hmm. the prophet. And how does a prophet know that they're a prophet and not a zealot? a prophet and not a sinner. And if, if the way we're categorizing a prophet is somebody who's very clear and is like, that is like a friend of God in one direction, then how do you know that you're right? Or you might just be a person in need of chuba. <laughs> so it's, it's a complicated thing, this single-mindedness um, for the cause. And, and how do you know if you actually should be more open-minded I've always thought about it, that being a conservative rabbi going, why do I have to be stuck in the middle? The people who seem to kind of know they're on this side or they're on that side. I like your expression there, for Brenta, right? But, and we need those people because the truth is, yeah, somewhere in the middle. So, so I feel really cool being the guy in the middle because all right, I'm already over where we're going. But you need the guy on this side and the guy on that side, right? Just like you showed the two orthogonal things, right? Pulling so that you get somewhere. You need that. I think that you have to have it. And if you feel like it's the truth, if it's, if it's like, uh, I think uh, Heschel talked about the difference between um, prophecy and uh, creativity or whatever, is that the prophet feels compelled. The, prophecy, the prophet can't just be like, well, I thought about that and that was kind of interesting. The prophet says, you've got to tell the message of you. If you feel so burning inside of you, then you have to give that message. And if you're wrong, I guess you'll, you'll take it up with God at <laughs> some point in time. Yes? I guess I don't see them necessarily mutually exclusive. It means that if you were wanted to have a singularity of mission, then you should still be open to all of the criticism and hopefully you have an answer. But yes, that's a good point, but this is why I say it's a good thing. That's what gives you the compelling <coughs> continuous nature. Mm. All right, so let's get the next paragraph, the third one. Therefore, penitence is natural for a person, and it is this that perfects him. The fact that a person is always prone to stumble, to deviate from justice and morality, does not discredit his perfection, since the basis of his perfection is the constant striving and the desire.
for perfection. This desire is the foundation of penitence, which is constantly a directing influence on his way in life and truly perfects him. If we're never going to get to that stage, why bother trying, right? I'm never going to be a what, you know, fill on the blank. So should I even bother? Of course, Rev. Cook would say. Part of being human is the constant desire to perfect yourself. And, be, and, and it, that part is the perfect part, is that you're constantly striving. So even if you have had the same resolution for the past however many years, right, on Rosh Hashanah, I should give up on it. It's been 20 years. I haven't done it yet. No. Right? That's part of your process. Maybe you have made game. Maybe you haven't. But this is part of your process. If you, have, if you still are feeling that, oops, to, to work on that, that's part of human nature. And keep going with it, and maybe this is your year. Any other thoughts on that? The only time you know you're wrong is if you think you've arrived. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Very nice. Right yeah, I gotta take some notes too. <coughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. It, in many ways, it's better. I mean, I was thinking what Naomi was thinking, but I think it's very self serving in many ways because you're striving to do better so that you can achieve original freedom, which is all about the self. Right? It's like literally not about the other at all. And it feels very ego driven and it feels very much against what Gordon was talking about. Mm -hmm. And this message is. If we're trying to think of a message of serving the other, this message is literally contradicting that, right? This is about the whole world is pervaded by harmony. You can't only get in touch with yourself. It's the self of the world. I, I don't. I mean, that's not how I read it. Just look at the first sentence. I mean, let's let's do the middle path. Yes, and. <laughs> Is it self-serving? Absolutely, because this is about your personal work. But your personal work is to connect to every single other thing in the world and to recognize the breakages in your connections with everything else. It's not, he's not, you know, the, the monk. He, I mean, especially in his work, he was constantly out there actually trying to work with the most secular Jews who were, who were in the world at the time, and, and he was trying to convince them through total sweetness and love and, and, and repair a connection to them, uh, uh, for them, to God. Yeah, so I think you're right in the sense it's the self, but it's absolutely also it's about those connections. Yes, one and two. But if the pure, the soul, if in order to experience the disturbances and those pains, your soul needs to be pure, how do those in the middle ground or those who aren't able to experience, how are they still able to when it seems according to Rob Cook, that everyone feels that need for penance, but how are they able to feel it if they're not able to feel the disturbance in that club? I think I would hope that he would say everyone's going to feel it. Yes, certain people are going to feel it really more, and some people are going to feel it really yeah. less, but I think because he thinks it's, you know, it's natural, see, right? You know, everybody has some little bit of inner critic, or some little sense. Uh, he gets into it a little bit later. He's like, if you're feeling depressed, he's like, Everybody goes through those bouts. He says, that's like the, the red flag, right? That's the warning. My life isn't exactly how it's going. Pay attention to those feelings. Get into, you know, and then, then you have to figure out, well, why, why am I feeling depressed? Or why am I feeling like my life is not the way I want it to be? So I think he, I think he feels people have some kind of ex existential experience and that then pushes them. Yeah. I just go back to what we were talking before, yeah. uh, which is this idea that there's maybe a disrepair within an individual. So there's a Kabbalistic notion that says there's, there's a need to do tikkun to meet, so mm -hmm. you have to repair yourself, and then hopefully if everybody's doing that repair, then you repair the world, mm -hmm. at least it's tikkun mm -hmm. a different way of understanding, but if there's brokenness below, then there's brokenness above. Mm -hmm. Below is that there's no shut on the flow mm -hmm. that happens, mm -hmm. but if there's work on repairing that, and that's through shuvah, mm -hmm. whatever it is, through whatever process, Beautiful. Um, it reminds me of a reading I used last year. Somebody said, you know, I 
realized the world is in disrepair, so I went out to change the world, but that was too hard, so then I realized, oh, I'm just going to change my own country. Yeah, even that was too bad. I'm just going to change my city. And I couldn't convince them. I'm just going to change my family. They wouldn't. I'm just going to work with myself. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that if I can fix myself, then I can influence my family, and my family can influence my city, and my city can influence my country, and my country can influence the world. Do you have? Yes. I was thinking about the word sickness in the previous paragraph. That, that um, it, it sounds very twelve step to me mm-hmm. in a sense, you know, and also very Freudian. You have to recognize that, and, and that's why I don't see it as ego. You know, it, it, that you're always in purple, mm-hmm. and you're always, you know, kind of between those bumpers and the the, the bowling, right? And you're bouncing around trying to, you know, keep going. Uh, and it's 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 liberating in a sense, you know, that you can connect as much as you can connect, and when you feel you disconnected, work on it. Mm-hmm. Very nice. I thought when he says the the flesh itself, which engenders the sin, mm-hmm. that that's like an interesting departure from a minute ago when it was our opinions and our thoughts. I was wondering, and not so familiar with writing the book. This. Is it, is it our bodily existence that leads us away from Shefa? Is it just in the spirit we find it, or? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone know? <laughs> I, 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 I don't have any idea. Um, we, I think what, what we're saying is, uh, you know, flesh, I, I would put it uh, as being um, selfish um, and that's the, the problem that we have when uh, you know we are not as perfect as we could be uh, in one of my uh, positions I you know this is very important to me the Shivan, I really love the plumbing idea it's, it's just uh, extraordinary um, but uh, we, I, I encounter people, I am a prison chapter, uh, so I encounter people that are uh, uh, at levels of imperfection that, uh, uh, you know, you couldn't imagine. Um, uh, but a, a great part of it is that they don't think of us, they don't think of uh, uh, the connections that, that you mentioned. And uh, you know you can call it flesh, you can call it drugs, you can call it uh, you know acquired things that are not theirs, etc., etc., etc. And I think that uh, um, you know we can replace uh, selfishness with uh, mm-hmm. with flesh because when we have selfishness, we don't have what you say is the connection. Mm-hmm. That that's what uh, what's missing there. And uh, here in commercials. I invite everybody. Uh, I think I, I'm uh, in current current county of York. I'm the only Jewish uh, chaplain, and uh, you know I am a big believer of uh, the Lemonolim, and uh, it's not shown to to, uh, to people. So if somebody wants, I I always like to take the um, um, volunteers uh, not with great success during the Seder to make sure. And we have. A few days this year because my people is on Shabbat. Uh, please come to me and we will go to prison uh, and uh, try to do. I also go to Kolema Tesa, which is also a very powerful moment uh, there. But, uh, but um, you know, as rabbis, I think we, we are facilitators of, uh, of the Shuba. Uh, we are really involved and uh, thank you. So we're just going to, because I want to get to a couple more things um, before our time is up, because we don't only have a little time. Go to the second page. The second paragraph there. Penitence comes, uh, excuse me, penitence according to reason comes after penitence according to nature and religious faith have already taken place. So he sees tshuva on many levels. Some people do tshuva because you're supposed to, right? Okay, it's the time we're supposed to do tshuva. It's a, it's a religious obligation. Or it's just naturally, as he talked about, and there's also somebody who kind of thinks of it more rationally. It represents the peak of penitential expression. 
This level of penitence is inspired not only by a natural malaise, physical or spiritual, or by the influence of religious tradition, whether it has induced in the person a fear of retribution or conditioned him to the acceptance of some law or precept. It is also inspired by a comprehensive outlook on life that came to crystallization after the natural and religious phases of penitence had registered their influence. This phase of penitence in which the previous are included abounds in endless delight, which fascinated me. Now he's going to talk about how awesome it is to do tshuva. Why? This is my favorite line in the whole thing. It transforms all the past sins into spiritual assets. From every error, it derives noble lessons. And from every lowly fall, it derives the inspiration for the climb to splendid heights. This is the type of penitence towards which we all aspire, which must come and which is bound to come. It made me think of uh, a lesson that I have been taught that usually when we think of Yetzir HaTov and Yetzir Hara is that we always want Yetzir HaTov to just like destroy and beat up, right? And totally conquer Yetzir Hara. That's, that's what we want. But then um, one of my teachers told me, he said, but there's a whole other level. Like, if you can just get to crushing Yetzir Hara, wonderful, great. And you're only focusing... He said, but, you know, even the rabbi sometimes said Yetzirah is necessary, right? There's that famous teaching, you didn't have Yetzirah, a man wouldn't build a house, man have a family, right? All those things aren't necessarily bad things. And he said, think about them, again, like, Kabbalistically, like energy, right? Maybe there's more energy Yetzirah towards, towards the other, and sometimes there's Yetzirah towards the self. Can you take that energy, instead of having one energy destroy it, have one energy transform the other energy? Right? Instead of taking a sin and saying, okay, a sin is a hole, and I just want to fill in that hole, I'm going to take that hole, I'm going to flip it up, and now it's, I'm out. Right? Instead of saying, okay, I made that mistake, I just want to fix it and make it even, but instead I'm going to take that mistake and I'm going to actually, almost like doubling it, right? It was negative one, but now it's positive one. Which is a fascinating, you know, usually we think all we can do, the best we can hope for is just to get back to zero, right? To fix that evil that we did, that rupture. Instead, we want to go back to the divine plumbing, right? It's not just fixing the leak, but you're actually, by fixing it, you're somehow adding more water into the pipe. Which is, I think, an amazing idea for people to think that first, the best they could do is just to get back to start, to neutral. But actually, by doing shuva, you get like a double effect. You've learned something more from the lesson, and it doesn't just make you back to an average person, it makes you into somehow a better person. Yeah. Yeah. I think that from every error, error, it derives noble lessons coming from a background in teaching. You don't learn from what you've done wrong, you're going to do it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And I think if you spiral through and you learn those lessons, you're going to put fan to the next time, mm -hmm. or the leak will be smaller, or it won't come. Or it won't yield to minor pressure, which only break if there is extreme pressure. Mm -hmm. Because they all have strengths and weaknesses, and God gave us both. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to, if the gates of the rod is there for a reason, then it's there for us to learn. Great. Thank it's you. the old idea of the whole of Why does it say Lavavacha, not Libacha? Because the second base and the Yetzir Tov and the Yetzir Rav both have to be involved in loving God. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Somebody else said that? Yeah. Also reminds me of the city teaching of the foreign road. That the knock in the foreign road makes it much stronger than it was before. Mm. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, what time is it? 11 more minutes. Oh, I get ball. Okay. Turn the page. Uh, let's see. The first um, thing, the first paragraph there, the steady concentration of one's thoughts on penitence forms a person's character on a spiritual foundation. He continually draws into himself a refined spirit which places him on a spiritual plane of life. This, I felt like, was just a reminder of, when do we do tshuva? Every single day right, of the year, right? What's that? Right, so... What I love about that is 
So uh, I live each day as if it's my last, which means I never do laundry, because who would want to spend their last day on Earth on laundry? Um, copyright. No, uh, let's see. What's that? I don't remember who taught that one to me, but every time someone says, you know, yes. that's what I think of, laundry day. Um, let's see. <laughs> um, let's look at the one, two, three, the fourth paragraph down. The pain felt in the initial inspiration to penitence is due to the severance of the evil layers of the self, which cannot be mended as long as they are attached to and remain part of the person and cause deterioration of the whole spirit. Through penitence, they are severed from the basic essence of the self. Every severance causes pain, like the pain felt at the amputation of deteriorated organs for medical reasons. This is the most inward kind of pain through which a person is liberated from the dark servitude to his sins and his lowly inclinations and their bitter after effects. We learn this from the law that liberates a slave if he lost a tooth or an eye or being struck by his master. Happy is the person whom you instruct, O Lord, and you teach him out of your law. A better phrase may be, reading, may be read as meaning, this matter you have taught us from your law. Part of, I think, and we'll get to this in a second, when we think about doing shuva, and I always kind of get a little bit depressed right before the high holidays, is it's tough to think about yourself as being bad, or that you didn't do the right thing, or that you could do better, and it kind of starts to get depressing thinking about that. And then you start to not want to do it and you don't want to keep going down this path of real self-criticism. It's painful. He said, right, if you're going to actually recognize that part of you, really you, I did that wrong thing, I said that nasty thing, I, whatever, didn't live up to I knew what I know I could have done at that moment, and say, this is a part of me and I actually want to take it out, it's as painful as a surgery. Granted, you have to do it, but it hurts. And nobody, right, we avoid pain like we avoid everything that we don't like. And so what's tricky, you have to be willing, kind of, I always think about it uh, every time I resolve to work out. And that first week is horrible, because everything hurts. <laughs> I know, intellectually, if I make it another week, I'll feel better. How many times have I only made it through the first week, <laughs> and it's and I stopped? We have to be willing to kind of push through that. Any thoughts on the pain caused by the chuva process? He goes into that a little bit more. Um, let's see. Look at uh, the next page, this the middle paragraph, the second paragraph there. It's necessary for a person to be united with the divine good in the soul of the community of Israel as a whole, and thereby he'll be aided toward penitence. At all times, he will be confronted by his shortcomings and sins which stem from his alienation from the people of God that gave him being, and this is the source of all the good in him. Let him not hesitate to link himself with the soul of the people as a whole, despite the fact that among some of its constituent individuals, there are also wicked and coarse people. This does not diminish in any way the divine light of the good in the people as a whole, and a spark of the divine soul is radiant even in the most fallen individuals. And because the community of Israel holds within itself the divine good, not for itself alone, but for the whole world, for all existence, by cleaving firmly to the soul of the people, he will come to cleave to the living God in harmony with the divine blessing that abounds in all things. The divine presence will then embrace him in all its majesty and might. I find here he's talking to both the religious Jews, I think, I'm imagining, in Eretz Israel, who are saying, oh, I'm going to talk to those seculars? They're full of all these bad people. Not, and they're saying to the secular people, you've got to cleave to the Jewish people, right? The Jewish people are religious people. You know, he's trying to get them. So part of this, I think he's trying to speak to two communities who are not liking each other. But for us today, where it can be a very individual process, right? Why can't you have teshuva chavarot, right? Where you have group, right? What are you working on? What are you working on? What, and you support each other. I can't be in my tshuva chavura with Jill because she does X, and that, that's going to bring me down. Yeah, and whatever it's, you do is going to bring her, right? Don't worry about the negatives and everything. Nobody's going to be perfect, but if we all recognize 
that we're all mostly good and we can support each other, right? Tshuva doesn't actually have to be a you know, sit alone, meditate kind of experience, right? Tshuva can actually be done in groups, which I don't know if people, when I read that, I was like, I don't know if people really think about doing tshuva in groups, but he would definitely argue for that. Um, there are, there's tshuva groups. What's that? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, Sherry, this is to your point. The last paragraph. Penitence raises a person above all the measures to be found in the world, but it doesn't alienate him from the world. On the contrary, he thereby raises the world and life itself with him. Those impulses are engendered sin, that engendered sin are refined in him, the mighty will that breaks all bounds, that influenced him to sin, becomes a living force that engenders great and lofty things for good and for blessing. Right? If you can fix yourself, you're fixing yourself. You naturally interact with the world. If you can perfect yourself, you're going to influence everything in the world that you are connected to. I'm sure we've all had the experience right, of being around those special people. Hopefully, you are all those special people for whomever you serve, right? And they look to you and they go, my goodness, they did that? I want to aspire to that level. I want to aspire to be doing that. And I hope that we all have our teachers and our people that inspire us and go, how, how are they so, excuse me, darn good all the time? I wish I could be like that, right? How do they find the time for all those important things that I think are important, but I don't somehow find the time to do those things? Right? But those people, just by their doing what they hopefully think is right for themselves, spread out that shefa, spread out that flow to us who are connected to them. Thoughts? All right. Moving right along, the next page. The dangers in repenting. Uh, let's look at it. Look at the second paragraph. This is again where you start being the self-critic and you don't want to get out of the house though. There's a defect in the lower level of penitence in that it weakens a person's will and thereby damages his personality. This defect is rectified when the thought of penitence rises to maturity. Then it becomes part of the higher penitence whose aim is not to weaken the will or break the personal character of the individual but to strengthen his will and to heighten his self-esteem. Where, uh, thereby the willful sins are transformed into a positive force. When the wicked turns from his wickedness and does that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Right? When we start um, that process of chuba, when we recognize, I, I did that thing. I consciously did that thing that I should not have done. I said the wrong thing, or I missed an opportunity when I know I could have. And it's all again about energy, right? It's all about flow. And I and I'm, I'm bad. I'm actually, I did the wrong thing. It's very hard for us often to admit that about, uh, about ourselves. And then we say, well, if I do those bad things with my will and my energy, maybe I should just stop doing. If I'm going to make bad choices, I shouldn't make any choices. And he's saying, you know, don't go down that path. When you're, get, when you're being self-critical, don't go to the path that everything then becomes, I have to withdraw from the world. But... Do the process of tshuva. Figure out how you're going to make those corrections, and then you can again, he believes, right, you get doubly back if you can actually do the process of tshuva uh, well. Because um, as he says in the next paragraph, when one shrinks the will, when one constrains the life force through inner withdrawal and the inclination to avoid any kind of sin, there's also the shrinking of the will for the good, right? If you start restricting certain things because you're afraid, oh, I might do another bad thing, you might never do another good thing. And that's, uh, and that's just as bad. Um, two minutes, not enough time. Okay. Uh, let's look at the last paragraph. One must not ignore any inclination to penitence, not even the most trivial, saying that the thought that suggested itself is too insignificant for a person of his stature, nor is uh, it's too insignificant for a person of his stature, nor is he to ignore the call to the highest, saying that it's beyond his reach. Everything merges into one edifice, one world of penitence, 
which is more precious, greater, and more ancient than all worlds. I feel like this is a, another easy pitfall that we fall into, is that we say, okay, here's the things that I have to change. Okay, those five things, those are easy, so I'll get to those later. All right, here's those five things. Oh, those are really hard. I don't have time to work on the big stuff now. All right, so I don't have to work on the small stuff. I don't have to work on the big stuff. I'll just not do anything. Right? It's so easy, I think, to fall into that, uh, to fall into that trap. And so he says, if this stuff is easy, do it. If the stuff isn't too, is, is too hard, at least start. Um, don't fall into, the, into that trap. You know, again, just to go back to the beginning, right? We're returning, right? It's, he believes it's natural. And he believes that it's ultimately about restoring divine connections between every single person and repairing that flow that is uh, the world. Even though Rabbi Tucker said, you know, it's the dangerous world, that's what Tikkun Olam was for, for the Kabbalists, right? It was restoring the world to its original place of connection. And uh, I hope that we can do that for ourselves and then by doing it for ourselves, we can then bring it to our communities, and then our communities can bring it to connect to other communities, and then to the rest of the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you.